Welcome back to the show, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for checking us out. Thanks for joining. We got a great episode. We got Tom Hatsis on the show. Tom is an author. He's a historian of all things psychedelic and entheogen, uh, witchcraft, magic, paganism, different religions, alternative Christianity, and really the intersection of all of those said things. Uh, fascinating guy, really uh, fun conversation. Uh, it was a pleasure to to meet virtually, meet him and speak with him. And I uh, hope you guys will like it as well. Tom has authored uh, three books, The Witch's Ointment being his most recent, Psychedelic Mystery Traditions, and also a book about microdosing, microdosing magic, a psychedelic spell book, which uh, I can't wait to check out. It uh, it sounds pretty cool. Uh, this is this is a, like a little outside of my my wheelhouse, but that's always fun and entertaining because I get to learn, and you guys get to hear me learn, and sometimes stumble around on like things that I want to ask or things that I want to say. So it's always fun. It's always fun to to go out there and get involved. I mean, I am really fascinated about all the things that we're talking about here in this podcast and the stuff that Tom is is spending his career doing. Um, Tom runs a website called psychedelicwitch.com. Go check that out. And he's the organizer, one of the organizers of the Guy in Mind Psychedelic Conference that happened in July. Uh, but uh, yeah, like I said, just a great Great uh, individual, really uh, enjoyed speaking with him, and he's also he was also recently at a breaking convention in the UK. So look out for the the video of that. I'll put that in the show notes, all the links and everything in there. If you guys love this show, you know what to do when you like stuff, when you're listening to a podcast, and you're like, hey, this is dope. I want to tell people about it. Just do that. And uh, if you want to go a step further. Hey, go and leave some five-star ratings and reviews or just five stars. Just go to Apple Podcasts, open it up, go to your Apple Podcasts app, go to Mike Adelic, just scroll down where it says, you know, ratings and reviews, click on that. All you got to do is, if you like the show, if you really love it, five stars. If you want to say something to me, uh, say, you know, leave a little review. I always love those. Those are great. And uh, yeah, to the person who left a five-star review asking how to get in contact with me, um, as your, <laughs> they left a five-star rating and then their review was, uh, hey, I'm trying to get in contact with someone here. I uh, can't respond to you. Uh, I don't know who you are and I don't know how to respond to a review on Apple Podcasts. So uh, there's no way to do that. Just go to my website, mikebrank, B-R-A-N-C dot com, and there's a contact form there. Just send me an email and I'll get it. And if you want to email, if you don't want to go there, you just want to email me, just email mikeadelicpod, P-O-D, at gmail.com. That comes right to me and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm here, ready and, and waiting to receive the gift of your email. Uh, you can also DM me on Instagram. Mikeadelic underscore podcast. You can message me on Facebook, whatever. Uh, you know what would be cool actually is to have like a, a way that you guys could send me voice messages. I saw someone someone else's website. They had that. It was pretty cool. Um, so I'm gonna look into that because that would be awesome if you guys could just like one click on something, record something, and drop it in. And uh, you know, Chris Ryan, he does these things where people send in little voice messages and put them on the show. So maybe we could do something like that if you're into it. Uh, but I think leaving voice messages is pretty cool too. So we can, we can do that too. I'll, I'll look into it. Um, but yeah, anyway, uh, thanks for all the love and support from everyone. And thanks to my newest Patreon members. Thank you so much for being Patreon members. Thanks so, so much for, uh, you know, choosing to contribute a little bit of money each month to help uh, this thing keep going because I'm about to start shilling out for ads and uh, I really don't want to do that. <laughs> it's just not really something that I'm super excited to be doing uh, unless it's really something that I'm just like completely obsessed with. Uh, then, then it's a little bit of a different story. But 
Um, yeah, thanks, guys. Uh, just big shout out to to all you guys who are donating on Patreon. If you want to donate on Patreon, just go to patreon.com slash Mike Brank, B-R-A-N-C, and you can donate as little as a dollar a month. One little measly rolled up crinkled dollar one month oh all the hard work that goes in you know just maybe even four quarters i don't know if you have two uh half dollar coins or a silver dollar whatever you got just uh give me your money because <laughs> uh i need some and no really but seriously it's uh it's much appreciated you know um this this show is just all me and I love doing it and so whatever you can do is fucking cool man so yeah just a big shout out to Ania Samuel Cole Camille and Danny you guys are are my my recent patrons you are my patrons but really you are uh the producers of the show you're like you have like stake you have skin in the game so uh go on when i'm on patreon uh you know i post bonus content sometimes i ask questions we have a mycadelic inner sanctum whatsapp chat group where people from all around the world are connecting and sharing trip reports and stories and all kinds of stuff offering support uh so you get in there and um and that's a good way to to bring people together, to bring the others, to find them and bring them together and create a little community here. All right. Yeah. Sponsors, hemp bombs, they got CBD stuff. So, you know, I, I, I really like those gummies. I could, I, I love eating them. I mean, I just like gummies in general, but, uh, the CBD gummies seem to help me sleep pretty good and wake up feeling nice and refreshed. So that's kind of my go-to. If you go to hempbombs.com and you put in the code Mike 15, you get 15% off and they ship everywhere in the Good old US of A. And uh, what else? We got Synchro, plant-based and keto nutrition products. So they're pretty good. I like the um, Keto Mana chocolate uh, packets. Good to throw in a bag, take them on a hike, get a high dose of keto, delicious coconut chocolate goodness. Uh, put in Mycadelic. Go to bsynchro.com, put in Mycadelic, and get 20% off. So, hey, I don't know. I'm just saying hemp bombs. Synchro's got you beat by a 5% discount, so, you know. And then, of course, my buddies Joe and Kyle, Navigating Psychedelics, they have a nice course available for all you noobs out there that want to wet your whistle into the psychedelic sphere. So uh, go check that out, because it's pretty cool. I mean, even if you're not, even if you're familiar with it, and you just, you know, want to feel like getting more of a formal education. Go check them out. Those links are all at the bottom of the show description, all the way at the bottom. It says thank you to the sponsors, and you go check them out over there. So that's all the boring fucking business bullshit. Thank you guys for like listening to this garbage. Uh, <laughs> man, if I could have if I could have it my way, I would just be wandering around in the woods with a toga on, just yapping all day. And whoever was like, you know, just eating mushrooms and just talking. And whoever was like, you know, around for it was just around for it. <laughs> I don't want to be doing a lot of this stuff. Hey, do you guys like fucking sour cream? Well, you're going to love putting sour cream on your tacos because we got 15% off for fucking sour cream shit. <laughs> I don't know why I said that. I guess I just had tacos and sour cream was at the top of my mind. Hey, subscribe for 15% off every month. You get a barrel of sour cream delivered to your apartment every day of the month. Every day of the month. <laughs> Man, my improv skills are just off the charts, guys. Um, I'm kind of tired. I'm sorry for this shitty intro. Um, yeah, I'm tired. I've had a hell of a fucking week, man. I spent uh, spent time camping in Crestone, Colorado, uh, which was pretty cool. Um, was down there with uh, past podcast guest Chris Ryan, 
And, uh, oh, yeah, if you're going to be in Denver, October 17th, I don't know if this is too early to announce or not, but fuck it, I'm doing, I'm going to be uh, on stage with Chris for his, uh, for his book tour, his book stop tour here in Denver, I guess that's how you say that, for his, uh, his new book coming out on October 1st called Civilized to Death, The Price of Progress. If you haven't listened to that episode, go check it out. Uh, it's a it's a great one. I really enjoy uh, hanging out with Chris and talking to him. So we're gonna be on stage jamming, rapping, um, you know, freestyling, whatever, improving, and talking about civilized to death. And that's gonna be October seventeenth in Denver. I think there's some other stuff, but I don't really remember. Um, yeah, I've been going through. Uh, I've been going through some shit uh, here. So I might do a solo cast on that. I should do a fucking solo cast, right? Like, don't I owe you guys a solo cast? I, you know, I recorded two solo casts in the last, uh, like, two months. And uh, I just didn't release them. So I don't know. I, I You know, er, on the early days of the show, I would just fucking record something and just send it out. And I wouldn't even listen to it. And I just put it out there and... You guys seem to like it. I don't, I don't know what's kind of blocking me right now from doing that. I, I don't know if maybe I feel like some of the solo casts are too, I don't know, what's the word, self-aggrandizing or, or um, I don't know what it is. I don't know what it is. I just, I just haven't really felt like this, oh, this is great. I'm going to put this out. And, you know, I really, I really want to put great stuff out you know um so stay on the lookout for those i will record something you know i've i'm definitely i'm definitely going through a transitional time in my life right now so if you guys want to hear about that you know what's going on for me and some thoughts and ideas and you know i think i also want to talk about the the trajectory of of the show and like where i want to take things and and how i want to I mean, I, I've always with this show, it's never just been about psychedelics, you know, and I think sometimes people see the name and they're like, oh, psychedelic, like it's the psychedelic guy. And, you know, I think psychedelics is like a core psychedelics and psychedelic ceremonial ritual use and community and that sort of thing has always been a core element of what this show stands for, you know, cognitive liberty and self-expression and, and all that kind of stuff. But I am interested in so many other things. So, you know, I, I want to sort of plan and prepare and strategize a little bit more. Anyway, whatever. I'm just rambling now. You guys will get it. You'll get it all. Thank you to everybody who listens and who shares the show. Thank you to everybody who supports the show. Like I said, Apple Podcasts, five stars, rating, review, patreon.com slash Mike Brank, dollar, two, three hundred million, whatever. And uh, sponsors, show notes, links, all that jazz. It's all there. Anyway, let's get into this conversation with Tom Hatsis. He's a, he's a fascinating, interesting, engaging, intellectual, and uh, fun guy and uh just filled with a lot of um weird esoteric knowledge and and we had a great conversation so let's jump into that right now psychedelics are illegal not because a loving government is concerned that you may jump out of a third story window psychedelics are illegal because they dissolve opinion structures and culturally laid down models of behavior and information processing. They open to us the possibility that everything we know is wrong. We don't need new laws that control our consciousness and rigidly place it in a prison. Cognitive liberty. The fact that as adults, if we're not hurting anybody else, we should have the right to explore the contours of our own consciousness without any mediation or legislation on the part of somebody else. Reject authority. Authority is a lie. Or is it perception? Information is power. But we have to seize, seize the, opportunity. the opportunity. The opportunity. I just uh, I want to 
you know, this is the only thing that, that confounds me is the technology. Like, supposedly we could land a man on the moon, but we can't connect through uh, Wi-Fi. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's like... Were you a Seinfeld fan? Yeah. Well, we can put a man on the moon. <laughs> <laughs> right, but but taste my coffee. Yeah, yeah. Right. No, I'm, I'm with you, dude. Like, I su- like when people... Like, even when you sent me, like, the Zoom thing, it's like, ah, shit. Like, for me, like, I like Skype and Facebook chat because they're both just simple. (laughs) Like, I don't know anything about technology. Like, I suck with this stuff. Yeah. But, you know, some things about maybe ancient technologies that we can get into on the podcast today. Yeah, definitely. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. I'm super psyched. Um, I have not got a chance to, to read your books and, and I apologize for that. It's just that I have, uh, yeah, it's just, I have so many people on the show and yeah. it's impossible yeah. to, to read everything, but, but anyway, that's why you're here. Cause I want to learn, I want to learn about this stuff. And I know my audience does too, cool. for sure. I did get a chance to watch a little YouTube clip of you, um, talking about, the psychedelic mystery traditions and um, how these are theogens. And I thought it was fascinating because, you know, my show is Mikeadelic. And I think a lot of people, like, I really attach to the Humphrey Osmond uh, definition, you know, of like mind manifesting. Yeah. And, and that's kind of what I wanted to make the show about, like not de- not just about substances and drugs and theogens, but about mind manifesting technologies and biological and natural and technological forms. So yeah. taking all shapes and sizes. Oh, yeah. yeah. I, I, I'm with you there. Psychedelic, uh, you know, as Humphrey Osmond coined it, is one of my favorite words, if not my favorite word. So I feel you. Awesome. Yeah. Well, maybe maybe we could start there in terms of like, you know, getting in getting into this exploration and learning about psychedelics. How did that uh, unfold for you? So when I was 18 years old, I ate mushrooms for the first time and I just kind of wanted to know everything I could about it. I was, you know, like most people, when you have mushrooms for that first time, you know, I I was just fascinated and floored and overwhelmed and enlightened and humbled all at the same time. And so when I, it's funny, I wasn't even planning to go to college, but I went to college because I wanted to study psychedelics and psychedelia. And uh, so I wrote my uh, my undergraduate thesis on Timothy Leary and his contribution to the fall of psychedelia, essentially about why, you know, uh, about how reckless he was uh, with these medicines. And um, then from there, I got my master's degree and uh, I continued my research into psychedelia. And I wrote my uh, my master's thesis on the LSD revolution that took place in academia in the 1950s. There was this whole, you know, at the time there was an, un, you know, this untold story of, um, you know, this academic revolution happening in the ivory tower with LSD before it made its way out to the streets. And uh, now, uh, you know, a lot of us know that story, but at the time I was taking my master's, not a lot of people knew that story. Uh, and uh, yeah, I've just been, studying and writing about these these uh, uh, plant medicines from a Western cultural perspective for about 20 years or so. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And and so, yeah, you brought up the, that was a good point that you brought up with with Leary, because I feel like we're in a place right now where, you know, we see kind of a, a div- maybe not a divide, but we see kind of like a wanting to sort of push away from that narrative and that imagery and move into something different. And I see that that definitely is unfolding. I mean, the psychedelic renaissance that we find ourselves in now is totally different than the one that was taking place in the 60s. You know, for one, there wasn't really a whole bunch of, uh, you know, wise old elders or, you know, set containers and traditions to really dive into. But because of work like yours, um, you know, the witch's ointment, the secret history of psychedelic magic, psychedelic mystery t- traditions, kind of diving back into this stuff and reviving it and, and having it out there, we have a much more broader range that we can we can learn from uh would do you think sure yeah well let me say that there's uh there's nothing wrong with the imagery and i i mean i love all the imagery i love psychedelic art um you know i love all of it i love psychedelic rock music i i love you know it's, it's fantastic right what uh what i talk about with leary is not so much the imagery it was how he went about 
Um, he, he was very dishonest in his studies, like with the Concord prison experiment, the Marsh Chapel experiment. Uh, you know, he, he really, he muted uh, data that conflicted with his personal beliefs, and that's a problem. Uh, there's also, uh, you know, th- there seems to have been some kind of power relationship with him and these substances and young women. And I don't want to get too deep into that because I'm not a hundred percent sure. But it, it there there seems like that was something that also took place, and. Uh, I'm not down with that. And in fact, in um, in Ralph Metzner's own account of some of these experiments, I mean, he was having a, a, a bad trip. And I mean, they just left him by himself in a room to just kind of deal with it. And it's like, that's, that's not what you do. <laughs> like, right. that's, a, that's a really terrible thing to do to somebody that's on a high dose of LSD or, or psilocybin. I don't remember what he was on at the time, but you know, uh, so it was more had to do with that. I mean, I, I absolutely love and embrace psychedelic culture. I, I, I love it. And I hope we don't move too far away from that. I hope we don't lose that, you know, as we do show more respect to the medical and uh, scholarly approach. Right. Yeah. Me too. Likewise. Like I love psychedelic music and festivals. Festivals and you know I love like the uh, recently I've been uh, I know Eric Davis wrote a new book called High Weirdness and I was like whoa that sounds really cool and I that's so cool yeah and I like this this kind of idea like he's exploring the ideas of the seventies and how you know Robert Anton Wilson and Terence McKenna and Philip K Dick kind of emerged at these as these like far out thinkers. And I love that stuff. I love like the the weird and the strange and the out on the fringes. And yeah, sometimes I feel like it's maybe, you know, when I look at great, these great organizations like MAPS and uh, all these, you know, Beckley Foundation, Imperial College, like they're doing wonderful, amazing things. And I I still want to kind of preserve the weird as well at the same time, you know? Well, it's it's preserving the interesting. And uh, you said that that book is called High Weirdness. What was the author's name again? Uh, Eric Davis. Eric Davis. I'm going to definitely look. Oh, okay. I'm going to look into that because uh, that sounds yeah, it sounds right up my alley. It, it, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, there's. I mean, what it is is there. There's a place for all of it, really. I um. I don't necessarily separate the sacred from the recreational as a lot of people uh, tend to do. Um, Like I think that for me anyway, and for friends for, you know, mine, like building, you know, a fire like in the woods and getting naked and dancing around it and eating mushrooms is actually very therapeutic and very spiritual. And there's, you know, would I recommend that for everybody? Well, no, of course not. I wouldn't recommend mushrooms for everybody. But to, to say that, oh, because we're having a good time making this art, making this music, just dancing naked and being with each other and embracing Mother Earth and being a part of her just cosmic web, like... That's deeply, well, it's spiritual and it's deeply therapeutic for a lot of people. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And, and yeah, it's such a, it's such a broad scope and, you know, diving into the past uh, also helps inform us of where we are now too. So, you know, with your investigation into these psychedelic mystery traditions, uh, what kind of things did you uncover in terms of the the uses and the practices? Of course, we know about, you know, the ceremonial and ritual uh, things, and, and I want to hear about that too. But did you uncover any sort of um, dancing naked around the fire type experiences as well? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you have definitely the uh, the Feast of Dionysus, although when it was done in March, probably not too many people dancing naked. But, um, you know, the, 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 uh, the mysteries of Dionysus were found all over the ancient world in Anatolia and parts of Greece. So different people have different ways of celebrating it. Uh, the uh, Roman Saturnalia also seems to have had a lot of that just general festive revelry and community. And I believe that that's what it was all about. And I believe community is a good thing. So again, you know, you get those kinds of instances. Uh, The rites of Eleusis were, I mean, they could be argued that it was communal, but I don't think that that's what the mysteries were really about. Um, And let's see, what else? Uh, I mean, you also get psychedelics used for more nefarious purposes in certain kinds of harmful magic, uh, certain kinds of warfare. Uh, There's this pretty 
impressive story. So in um, in 1000, uh, before the Common Era, it was the King Nopus, who was the king of uh, the Athenians, was at war with the Ionian state. And so he went to go see an oracle to determine you know, what, what his next move should be. And this oracle said to him, well, if you really want to win, you need to place as the general of your armies this priestess of the school of Hikati named Chrysemi. So Nopus was a you know smart man. He wanted to win, mm-hmm. you know the, the the battle. So he he put this this woman that this uh the, this um this magical woman at, as the head of his armies. So what Chrysemi did was walking out to the battlefield. She had an altar put up, and um, she then fed a bull some kind of psychoactive. We don't know what she fed it, but maybe a mushroom. But we don't really know. And she left the bull in the stall for an hour. So she has the altar out on the battlefield. An hour later, she brings. She has a uh, uh, people bring the bull out. But by now, whatever the bull ate had started to affect it, so it broke free and ran into the enemy camp. Now the Ionians, the enemies, they started to laugh at Chrysemi, saying, "How oh, this is what happens when you put a woman as your general." So they sacrificed the bull and uh, to their gods, and they ate it, which is what you did with sacrificial meat. You then feasted upon mm-hmm. it. Well, the thing is, whatever Chrysemi fed to the bull had transferred from the bull to the Ionian soldiers. So after they started to show, you know, like symptoms that they were under the influence of something, General Chrysemi ordered her troops in and they slaughtered them all. Hmm. And that's why we today have Athens. Wow. Wow. Powerful. <laughs> yeah. So psychedelics were also used in that kind of way. Right. <laughs> yeah. uh, they were used in love magic as well. You would, you, know, you would give somebody some kind of potion that might have your menstrual blood in it, maybe mixed with their semen and maybe opium. Mandrake was a popular psychoactive put in love filters. Um, you know, we have a few authors that, that make reference to it. Uh, so, I mean, really for every kind of purpose, I mean, they're, they're, they, when you look back into how ancient people viewed, see, uh, they didn't have legal status in those days. So there was no, like, we have kind of a binary way, like our way of thinking about psychedelics and entheogens starts in kind of a binary way that didn't exist in the ancient world. It was just chaos. I mean, people use these for whatever purposes they wanted, you know? Right. Yeah. I mean, it, uh, you know, in, in the description of the book here, you're talking about how, uh, you know, that this has been in existence from the crusaders to Aleister Crowley from, you know, from the ancient times until the modern times. And, you know, I remember reading this great book by Douglas Rushkoff called, uh, you know, it was a graphic novel called Aleister and Adolf about like sigil magic. And, um, yeah, it was, it was just fascinating. And, And have you heard of it? No, I haven't. Oh, it's really cool. It's yeah, it's like how it, during World War II, and they, you know, the Nazis, uh, Adolf Hitler had kind of like hijacked this, uh, you know, the 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 symbol for the Nazi Party from, uh, I guess it was a Buddhist symbol. Uh, oh yeah, sure, the swastika. Right, and kind of like in, you know, it was this peace and love and unity symbol, and they kind of imbued it with this power so to speak and then where uh winston churchill then gathered like crowley together with uh, i forgot the author's name who wrote uh ian fleming from james bond and they were kind of trying to come up with something and they wound up coming up with the v for victory um so i i, I was wondering like th- these kinds of practices were happening back then and then he's talking about it also happening at this time in this is world war ii period uh is there things that are happening like that today? Do you see maybe us living in still existing in the same kind of world of magic and witchcraft and, you know, psychedelic use to gain altered states to try and do something in the material world? Sure. I, I, I guess it depends on where you live. Um, I live in Portland. So the answer is absolutely yes. Mm -hmm. Like there's a lot of that around here. But my guess is if I went to like Lubbock, Texas, the answer would be no. Right. So, you know, it really depends on on where you are and, uh, you know, who you're surrounded by and what kind of access you have to these kinds of medicines. You know, I I really don't know. You know, I, I mean, I, there are certainly pockets all over the place. There are certainly people. I mean, there's an entire global network of underground facilitators. So... I mean, they're still out there and, and, you know, they've been out there for, 
you know, really hundreds of thousands of years, you know, doing this. So yeah, they're still out there. Awesome. Yeah. And I'm wondering maybe if we can get into more uh, of the language around this stuff, right? We talk about psychedelics and altered states and theogens, and you coined this term sure. theogen. Um, and there's another one, right? So uh, yeah, there's a few I have. Right. Uh, and so maybe we can get into those and as well sure. as kind of breaking down divination and alchemy and witchcraft and how these are all related. You know, if, if you wouldn't mind maybe kind of uh, putting on your professor hat and, and walking us through some of these, these terms, that would be great. Absolutely. Where would you like me to begin? Uh, how about some of the ones that, that, that you came up with? Okay, sure. Uh, so l let me do this. So there's a reason that I came up with the words in the first place. So maybe I should uh, should start there. Um, when you let me actually let me approach this a different way. When when Humphrey Osmond coined the term psychedelic in 1957, he did something extraordinary, which was he took these medicines out of the psychotomimetic, meaning mimicker of psychosis paradigm that they were couched in at, at the time. So uh, later on in the 70s, I think it was 79, when Carl Ruck uh, coined the term entheogen, it was because he looked at certain practices from the past, specifically the, the rites of Dionysus, and he said, well, you know, a psychedelic, yeah, maybe, but that's really not what's going Like these people, they're not really, you know, manifesting their mind, or I guess they are in a way, but they're doing something a little bit more than that. And so he came up with the word entheogen, which I'm sure all your listeners know right. uh, means to generate divinity within. So going off of that idea that our understanding of these plants and their effects can only go as far as the vocabulary that we have for them, I came up with a, a few new words in the spirit of Karl Ruck's uh, entheogen and um, uh, Humphrey Osmond's psychedelic. The, the foundational word theogen is based off of Karl Ruck's entheogen. The difference is that it just means generating divinity, which is specific in that Karl Ruck's is entheogen is generating divinity within, as in within yourself. But people didn't always use these medicines or these psychedelics, or call them what you will, to generate divinity inside themselves. Sometimes they generated divinity outside themselves. Some people still that do that today. I know someone who eats mushrooms and goes and, you know, talks to UFOs. Mm. You know, that is not generating divinity inside of him. That is, at least from his perspective, opening, you know, a, you know, a portal or opening the veil between himself and these other dimensions. So that's not really entheogenic. Right. So, um, so theogenic as just a general term, and then uh, building on that, I have words like okay. So, um, some of the earliest uses for these for these medicines that I could find in my research was to kind of knock you into a deep sleep, so as to meet the goddesses and gods in the dream world. Uh, that's the the first few chapters of my book go, get into that. Uh, so that's not necessarily entheogenic or psychedelic. This person is, is meeting up with a divinity that is separate from the self, but in the dream realm. So I call that somnotheogenic, generating divinity in dreams. Um, other times, if you're using like psychedelics and magic, I call that pythogenic. So just using psychedelics and magic. Um, oh, uh, we would all mostly agree I would think that psychedelics enhance the creative process. Mm -hmm. And yet we don't actually have a word for that, right? There, there's no actual word for that. So I came up with poetogen mm. to use psychedelic poetogenically, to use uh, psychedelic to enhance creativity and art. Um, there's also mystheogen, which is teaching somebody occult secrets using um, psychedelics. Uh, there's the, there are some great uh, witch cases. You, you had mentioned uh, witchcraft before. In um, in Finnmark, there were uh, some witch uh, cases in the 1600s, wherein it seems that the these women were using ergot to teach other women the secrets of witchcraft, <laughs> which is pretty cool. You know that that's you know that, I don't know I, I think that's yeah. pretty awesome. Uh, 
I mean, it unfortunately it didn't end well for those women, but the the idea that people were using it in such a way. So and the, anyway, I would call that mystheogenic or the rites of Eleusis would also be mystheogenic uh, if they were using a psychoactive, which I'm not 100 percent sure they were. Uh, but, it, it, you know, presuming they were, then I would call that mystheogenic. Uh, let's see. What else is there? Um, uh, is that is that mystheogenic like mystery theogenic? Yeah. OK, yeah. cool. Exactly. Um, I think that's all of them. Well, that's a good amount of words to make up. <laughs> that's great. Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. it's just based off of reading cases from the ancient world that didn't fit entheogenic or psychedelic. And it's like, all right, well, what, you know, what can we call this? So they're all modern words. Like nobody in ancient Greece called what they were doing pythogenic magic, you know? Right. Um, it's just a word I came up with because, you know, from Pythia, which was their word for magic. Right, right. Yeah. And, and like you said, it was just kind of chaos, right? Like they were just using it for whatever. They're like, oh, this is good. Let's do this. Let's mix this. It wasn't sort of set and defined. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, not at all. And and then you have other things that where we don't even know what they were talking about. Like uh, Pliny makes reference in his natural history to something called the Sagal. And we, we have uh, it's apparently Persian mystics used it to induce uh, trance states. So it was some kind of psychedelic, but we have no idea what it was. Uh, there's also in ancient Greece, you know, this enigmatic ivy. They they. Uh, especially in references to Dionysus, the, 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 these uh, there's talks of and mentions of ivy that, based on the descriptions, like a, like for example in Plutarch, he's clearly talking about something psychoactive. Like he says that it has the effects uh, similar to a wineless drunkenness. So you know he, he's talking about something, uh, but we don't know what kind of ivy. There's no kind of ivy uh, around today that uh, that has these kind of effects, at least that we know about. Uh, and it, it's possible that this uh, this particular form of ivy went extinct. You know, we don't know, or it could have just been a general term for anything. Uh, the way if if you know we were to say psychedelic or drug or you know whatever, that you just you know you had ivy. You know who knows. Right, right. So the records are all fragmentary, and uh, we 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 certainly don't get uh, you know uh, uh, deep details, but we do get enough to paint a picture. Right. Yeah. And so some of these uh, words that you've coined kind of fit into sort of where my mind was going when I was looking at, you know, when I'm talking about alchemy and witchcraft and stuff, because I'm kind of thinking of it from a psychedelic point of view. But also then there's these these rituals and these traditions that don't involve psychedelics. Is that right? Oh yeah. So what 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 you what you get is this, or at least from my research, what I what I've come to put together is this general structure. You have a broad belief. Let's say you're a Valentinian Gnostic, right? Valentinian Gnosticism has nothing to do with psychedelics at all. However, within Valentinian Gnostic, Gnosticism, you have individuals like this guy Marcus, who we know about, who absolutely did use psychedelics in his own kinds of rituals. So you, you have to look at the broader culture see which kind of groups might be prone to using these things and then see if anybody is actually using them. And sometimes no one is, and uh, sometimes people are. And again, it's just chaotic. Right, right, right. Yeah, and it's hard to find, too, and digging through all this stuff. I mean, you know, you're talking about doing your uh, your dissertation on Timothy Leary, and then, you know, after that, you know, your your thirst for, for more, your curiosity to kind of dive in, did that lead you then to uh, exploring sort of the, the deeper traditions? I think, was it your, uh, was uh, The Witch's Ointment your first book, or was? Yeah, some... The Witch's Ointment was my first book. Uh, uh, so what happened there was I was originally going to turn uh, on the advice of my, my, my thesis advisor, I was going to turn my master's thesis into my first book, the one on the LSD revolution of the 1950s. Right. And then, um, around, I think it was 2007 or 2008, 
uh, someone named uh, Erica Dick, who I'm actually going to be on a panel with in two weeks at Breaking Convention, which is going to be great to, to meet her. Uh, she came out with a book called LSD Psychotherapy, I believe. And uh, while she mostly focused on Humphrey Osmond and Saskatchewan, where he worked, that was kind of the crux of my master's thesis. And my fear was, oh, everyone's going to think I'm just ripping her off if I write I this see, book okay. now. So I said, all right, I, I can't write this book. So I was looking around for ideas and I came across this, um, this thing called the Holy Mushroom. And I was fascinated by it. And I was like, oh, you know, let me see about writing a book on this. And the more I researched it, the more I realized there wasn't really anything there. And then let's see, I pretty much had also back when I was th thinking about writing um, the, the Holy Mushroom book, I also started thinking about the witch's ointment and started collecting papers and everything. And uh, when I saw that there was nothing to the Holy Mushroom, I settled on writing the witch's ointment. Right. Oh, sorry. I, I said your dissertation on Tom, uh, Timothy, Le Thomas Leary. Timothy Leary, I, I meant to say it was the uh, master's thesis on the psychedelic uh, activity that was happening in the 50s. That's, that's yeah. okay. All right. Yeah, I, I, I knew what you meant, though. Okay, cool. Sorry, I just want to make that correction. Right. So, so yeah, that's that's interesting. What was uh, as you learned about this, the holy mushroom, um, and that started to unfold into what would later become the the witch's ointment. Uh, I'm wondering, what was that? Was that sort of kind of was it more outside of your realm of thinking? And then when you when you were when you started diving into this, you you started to kind of put together because I think what you have here is a very unique. Uh, you know, production of of information and, and exploration in, in your in your books, and uh, they're they're kind of connected. I, would that be fair to say? I mean, the kind of going back to the witches and going yeah. back to the mystery traditions and going back to to that period of time that 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 really excites you, right? Like that ex exploration is really something that you're really heavily invested in. Well, yeah, the intersection of magic, spirituality, and psychedelics. Right, right. That's really those are those are my main areas uh, that I that I really enjoy. Um, I uh, the reason I focused first on um, the 1950s uh, was for a very practical reason. I, I didn't read any. I couldn't read any language except English. Oh, I could read a little Spanish. Um, and a, a little Italian, but I didn't read Latin yet. And all the documents that I had to look at were in Latin. So that's, you know, the witch's ointment took 10 years to write because I had to teach myself Latin halfway oh through my God. the process of writing wow. it. Yeah, it was, yeah, I, I started writing it and um, I, I had a firm grasp on the secondary source literature, but I wanted to go back and check and read certain things because I, I, you know, I had a little bit of a handle of Italian and I could read Spanish. Um, they don't really help you too much except for the vocabulary because the syntax is totally different with Latin. But, um, you know, so I have a workable knowledge of, of Latin now. Nothing, you know, I'm not nowhere near an expert or a scholar in the language. But um, a lot of the texts that I was looking at were all written very, you know, in very basic language. Like I was looking at um, medical books. But medical books that were written for common people. So the recipes, and there's so many, you know, there's a lot of psychedelic recipes in there, you know, they're written for real, any mm -hmm, person mm -hmm. to understand. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know? and as we look back at these times, there's still that prevailing sense of fear from the dominator culture, from the powers that be in the time. Maybe the Catholic Church was in more of a position of power back then than it is now, uh, as we see. Yeah. As oh, we see certainly. kind of. Yeah, yeah. Yes, Corporations <laughs> and government kind of coming together in this day and age to form the sort of dominant uh, control in our in our world. But there's still the fear that that's that fear of like, what's going on? What are they doing? These are heretics. This, you know, they're 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 operating outside of the three by five card of allowable opinion, thought and expression in our society. And we demonize that and we we say, no, that's no good. And of course, that's where people get burned at the stake and all this terrible stuff happens. So it, that that sort of uh, that you know, thing that was taking place back then. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm just curious as to sort of maybe your thoughts on why that was such a maybe threat to the established power. Is it, did they see it as a threat? What was this kind of, 
reason for demonizing these practices? Sure. So we, we have to think about it from the perspective of the 1400s when this idea of satanic witchcraft first started to form. This is straight off the, uh, the tail or the trail, excuse me, of um, – a series of natural disasters, plagues, crop failure, starvation, disease, syphilis, um, all kinds of new things. The world was going, you know, to shit. Uh, can I say shit? Oh yeah. Shit it up. Okay. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> use the, use the full well, extent of the English language. <laughs> got it. Got it. Um, so the world was going to shit. And the thing is when you believe in a just God, and things are going to hell, there must be witches. So it wasn't just an authority thing, which it certainly was, and that that is, you know, I'm, I'm not downplaying that at all. But you have to remember that the common person on the street also believed in this stuff. Most of the people that were brought to trial for a witch accusation began with one neighbor taking another neighbor to court. And it's only after the Inquisition or, you know, uh, you know, theologians with inquisitorial ideas stepped into the interrogation process that you start to get these, you know, talks of, you know, Satanism and demon worship and all that, you know. So, right. yeah, I, I mean, it, 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 so they, they were kind of looking for someone to blame it on. Yeah, they were looking for someone to blame it on. And everybody thought that this person was actually the problem. Well, not everybody, right. you know, not every, I shouldn't say everybody. Of course, you had people that were like, Jesus Christ, you know, there aren't witches, get them <laughs> off the stake. You know, you definitely have right. those. But, you know, uh, the a lot of people, you know, we're talking about rural individuals. I mean, like beyond anything we can imagine today. I mean, think of the most rural place you can imagine uh, with people with very little education. Yeah. Now, multiply that times a thousand. And that's what you're dealing with when you're talking about people living in the backwoods of Germany in the 1400s. Right. Yeah. And and you made a good point too. Whereas the uh, you know the prevailing belief systems of the time kind of shape the container for you know the language of the experience and and what is taking place. Exactly. Well, this must be some kind of demon sorcery. This must be some devil stuff that's going on. Yeah. And oh, yeah. 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 There's yeah. actually a guy named Gene Vincent. It's 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 a really good uh, quote. Um, uh, he was writing in the um in the mid 1400s and we don't really know much about him he just we, he left us this little brief treatise on demonology and um he writes in it that um he acknowledges that wise women that are skilled with uh herbs uh the the latin word is uh wenefici, which means a uh, herbal woman or poison woman he says that they know about these kinds of psychoactives that cause you people to be able to fly in their minds and transform into animals and but most of the time these things just kill people the thing is even though they say that it's through the use of these herbs that they fly you know like in their spirit it's actually the action of demons the demons are the operative cause and the psychoactives are the secondary cause hmm. so there's that acknowledgement hmm. there he you know people knew that that's what they were doing but they didn't want to say that because if you if you take the devil out of the picture and this is just a you know a psychedelic experience for lack of a better term or a theogenic experience then there's there's no role for the inquisition <laughs> like this is just some kind of psychedelic experience there's no devil here right yeah yeah the devil is the one that we we create yes. um as in my opinion, yeah, and so, what kinds of uh, of things were these witches uh, and their ointments? Uh, what kind of things were they getting into? I, I remember hearing a story. I believe it was uh, Mitchell Gomez from Dance Safe was was telling me this story about how maybe he got it from from reading your book, and it was like how the the they would put uh, like some kind of ointment on the end of their broomsticks and insert it into their vaginas and is that is that accurate or is that <laughs> is that, were, were they doing things like that and if so what were the kind of typical uses for the sort of practices that they were they were engaging in uh sure yeah great question 
Uh, I, I recently just finished an article. It actually just got accepted today for the Journal of Psychedelic Studies. Um, oh, where, great. Congrats. Yeah. yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank you. And um, I actually I get pretty deeply into this. So here's what happened. Um, yes, it is a it is a charming uh, picture of a, a person or a woman, you know, oiling up a broom and masturbating with it. But there is no <laughs> historical truth to that at all. Um, okay. the, that was invented by. Uh, Michael Horner or Michael Harrison, one of them, in 1973. And uh, Michael Harrison wrote The Roots of Witchcraft, and he kind of mentions that. And then Michael Horner wrote in um, Hallucinogens and Shamanism in his very famous uh, piece on, you know, the the, the European, um, the, the, uh, the plant medicines of European witches. And it's a great piece. Um, he's the one that really kind of uh, expands on the idea that, you know, women were uh, applying the ointment in such a roundabout way. Now, the two sources that he cites, one comes from a guy named Bergamo, and Bergamo doesn't actually ever say that people did this. Uh, he has misapplied the quote that he uses, and I, I get into that in the article. And uh, the other one he uses, uh, Harner uses, is from the trial of Dame Alice Kittler from uh, 1324. The problem with this is that in uh, popularly, if you were to Google, let's say, Dame Alice, uh, something will come up um, in your search that'll talk about a pipe of ointment upon which Dame Alice greased a staff upon which she ambled thick and thin. Now, the thing is, this that line doesn't appear anywhere in the original trial record. I translated it myself. It does not appear there. It makes its first appearance 200 years later in a book called The Chronicles of Ireland, written by a guy named Raphael Hollingshead. Now, Margaret Murray, in, who in the 1920s wrote The, uh, the Witch Cult in, uh, in Western Europe, she also picks up this idea on you know, the broom and the applicator and all that, and she cites Hollingshead. She doesn't cite the original trial record. Now, what's, what's kind of ironic and funny is that in her book, Margaret Murray actually says that Hollingshead is not a reliable source, <laughs> and then she cites him anyway. Mm. Now, it was from Murray that Harner got this idea. So nobody ever went and looked, except for me, at the original trial record to see if it was even there, and it's not. So that's how that idea kind of be, you know got brought into popular culture and then everybody just you know you know took it from Harner after that you know they just followed his lead but um while people were using these right. ointments and women absolutely were using their fingers to um you know rub the ointments in their uh vaginal uh, uh cavities they still like they weren't using brooms like there's not a record of it anywhere anywhere and i've looked at a ton of them and i have colleagues that have looked at them and collectively there there's a number of us that have looked at all of these records or at least all the ones available and there's no mention anywhere of anyone masturbating with an ointment covered broom right and, and it's just because of this one instance where something gets put out there and then it kind of just it gets plugged into the collective consciousness and and then we see you know this play out um, so I'm just, wa I'm wondering if this is how, you know, things kind of take off. Like we see, like when I think maybe the average person hears magic or witch, like they think, okay, Harry Potter or, you know, the wicked witch of the West in the, in, uh, what's a blanket on the movie wizard of Oz. And, uh, you know, the, the, they become these sort of tropes in popular culture. So is there any actual like roots to these things or is it just things that kind of get misrepresented and then we just take them? Well, and there run with are, if I'm understanding your question, it's that yes, there were wise women skilled with these, with this knowledge of herbs and stones and the ability to divine and prophecy. Absolutely. Uh, there were no witches in the theological sense that is in the diabolical Satan worshiping woman who's trying to <laughs> destroy the you know planet earth. That person didn't exist in history. So our, yes, right. our modern, concepts of a witch as evil it is mostly colored by the church really i mean these 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 people were individuals uh, were some of them um evil yeah of course were some of them uh very nice and benevolent and helpful and pillars to their communities of course so you know you, you run the, the um the spectrum with them but our our modern 
you know, concept of an evil witch is just, you know, it's theological bullshit, really. It's just misogyny <laughs> when it comes down to good, good mm, old misogyny, right? right? right always, yeah. always, always around the corner waiting to show its ugly face. Yeah, ready, ready to just come in and and take take claim to their uh, what they what they want to do. Yeah, you know, what's that, interesting that, if, if I could just yeah. expand on that in a mo- for a moment is that psychedelic yeah, mystery please, traditions. Yeah. I actually get into the kinds of psychedelic experiences Christians, medieval Christians, were having, and they're using a lot of the same stuff like mandrake for example comes up a lot in christian writings i know that we we have this this kind of paradigm or this trope today that you know the 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 church in medieval times you know they banned you know psychedelics from everybody except for this powerful christian elite that's not true at all they very often recommended some of these uh substances um so things like mandrake and that's what they were using their whole problem was you had to have jesus as your co co-pilot like all of their psychedelic mystery symbolism within orthodox christianity it's all orthodox you know like uh, duh, it's orthodox christianity you know so and it's striking for how orthodox it is what these women were doing was worshiping a female divinity that's what the problem was the problem wasn't that these women were using mandrake or any psychoactive nobody cared about that yeah they didn't care. i see it was that yeah. they were worshiping feminine divinities that was the problem right oh wow 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 i mean yeah that's yeah, the, 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 uh the, and that just that that seems to be that seems to just be a, a problem that 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 plagues us for for yeah, all time yeah. like it's like hey 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 you need to worship this gray bearded man in the sky and that's it there's no other there's no earth mother there's no sky mother there's no other divinities it's this one and yeah, that's it yeah and that you know and, and people ended up for the state at the stake for that it's it's going back to when i was talking about how you have to look at the broader cultural sphere and then break it down and see who within that might have been using a psychedelic when i was talking about the gnostics and how marcus did that within valentinianism so the the right. uh, the witch's ointment the the quote unquote witch's ointment um that works the same way so you have this general belief in fertility goddesses fertility goddesses were the one pagan belief that christians found so difficult to eradicate with, with the rise of the church that's how popular these divine mothers were so you have this broad belief in divine mothers now were all the people that worship these divine mothers using psychoactives absolutely not the majority of them were, were certainly not there was only a few within that that we're doing it the the church never condemned using like uh, specifically the the uh the psychoactives themselves they condemned the, the the belief and within that belief the use of psychedelics was brought into it right yeah the, well it you know you, you make such good points here because it's like you know I'm, t- I'm talking and i'm like oh yeah well maybe it's like this or that but there's a nuanced area it's like yeah maybe some people were some people weren't it wasn't this overall thing and yeah. i think uh you know as human beings we have this tendency to kind of want to put a definitive label on something and say, well, this, you know, the Catholic Church was you know, purely evil and they were stomping out all this stuff because they didn't want people exploring with altered states. But as, as you're arguing here, you know, it's like, well, there's some there's some more nuance to explore there and there's some more, you know, some more things that we should dive into. I noticed on your website, you're, you're talking and we, we spoke a little bit about the holy mushroom uh, and you have a, a little section on your website that kind of goes into that a little bit more. And I know that a lot of people... Uh, have explored this. I'm sure there's there's podcasts where people are talking about this as well. You know the 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 mushroom, the Amanita muscaria, being this symbol that of Jesus. And I'm wondering maybe if if we can kind of get into that. And and you also brought up the Gnostics as well. And I think that that was a part of their 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 uh, their belief system in terms of that looking at this from a from a different kind of way uh and and maybe yeah maybe you can kind of elaborate uh, on that a little bit so um i'm about to say a mouthful because i'm preparing right now i'm debating jerry brown uh at breaking convention in two weeks uh on this very topic yeah so i'm oh great thinking about it a lot in these past few months. Uh, Let's see, where to begin with the Holy Mushroom? Okay, we have to start with John Marco Allegro, because what's interesting to note about the the Holy Mushroom hypothesis, how as it exists today, it is so far removed from what John Marco Allegro, the guy who invented the, the Holy Mushroom hypothesis, ever had in mind. 
And you could actually trace culturally how this idea evolved into what it is uh, today. Now, so John Marco Allegro argued that buried in New Testament linguistics, he was an etymologist. Uh, I know a lot of people often cast him as a biblical scholar, but he wasn't. He was a, uh, a philologist in comparative uh, Semitic languages. Oh, well, I, uh, I don't know. What, what's a philologist? I don't know what that... A philologist studies the roots of words and language. So a, a linguist studies different languages. A philologist studies the building blocks, oh. uh, what are called phenomes, the building blocks, the sounds of language, like how we evolved out of grunts and moans into language. Mm, oh, interesting. Cool. Yeah. And he was brilliant at that. Don't get me wrong. John Marco Allegro, like reading his book, I mean, it, it, it's, it's fascinating and it's brilliant. The problem is that also reading his book, you can see that he was absolutely not a biblical scholar whatsoever and completely misapplied um, even language, his area of expertise in the Bible and doesn't address some key problems with the language. Like, for example, that the Gospels, uh, the, uh, the four Gospels and the letters of Paul were all written in Greek. Now, Allegro doesn't get into Greek at all, and or I say a little bit he does, and uh, I have some colleagues uh, who read Greek. Uh, my mom reads Greek, my guy reads Greek, and uh, they all say that he had absolutely no knowledge of the Greek language whatsoever. Um, he was very much at home with ancient Sumerian, but that has no place in what we're talking about here. Now, even if there are some word roots from some like Ur- you know, religion that made their way into the Greek language. That's fine. Totally, totally good. Good. Uh, uh, excuse me. That's all well and good. But the people writing thousands of years later, like the Greeks writing those texts, like whoever wrote the gospels that we call Matthew, Mark, Luke, Luke and John, they had no idea about philology or ancient languages or how to break this down. The, one of the problems with the theory itself is that in order to craft it, you have to be as brilliant as John Marco Allegro, who is a Manchester educated genius. <laughs> Nobody living in the ancient world had these abilities. There were no universities back then. You know, so it, it's it's just it's a completely anachronistic idea. Now, what happened was in his book, he uh, included a picture of what is famously uh, known as the plain Corral fresco, which he said shows an Amanita muscaria mushroom. Right. The thing is, it doesn't show an Amanita muscaria mushroom, and I'm about to rip it to shreds in two weeks so i don't want to give too many hints uh, or anything right now but just know that uh by the time i'm done with it no person that looks at it will be able to see an omnita muscaria ever again because they'll know what it actually is and it's it'll be awesome well, i shouldn't say no and that that's kind of arrogant <laughs> uh i hope you do. well that's no i mean that's cool i i, I think breaking convention usually records uh for oh, yeah, videos so right yeah Oh, oh yeah. excellent. Cool, cool, cool. I can't wait to see that. That's yeah, because it's I mean, I think there's a and there's a there's a tendency to kind of want of you know, there's a tendency to, to like oh, of that. Course. Oh yeah. Oh perspective. yeah. Look, I want to be you wrong know? here. Like I, I think mushrooms and crit I think that's amazing. <laughs> like I would have written a book about it. That's such a cool idea. But uh so getting back to it real quick. So what happened was with the plain coral fresco, uh John Marco Allegro put that in his book, but he didn't say too much about it. He just he dedicates like three sentences to it. People took that image and just created these whole new memes and ideas and whatnot out of it and took this idea that, okay, so there's this one mushroom here, but it isn't. And they say, oh, if there's one here, well, there has to be mushrooms in other places. There has to be other ones. So they went looking and they had their confirmation bias and their blinders on. So as soon as they saw anything that kind of looked like a, a dome top with a... Um, with, you know, on a stem, which is what trees look like as well, incidentally, they would just check it off as a mushroom. Uh, there are actually six categories of mistake that every single supposed mushroom fits into, six categories of natural explanation that, are, you know, where you don't need conspiracy theories, you don't need special pleadings, you could just look at it 
look at the evidence and be like, oh, yeah, that's that's what it is. I mean, and I'm going to demonstrate that at Breaking Convention. So if you're going to be at Breaking Convention, get your tickets. Awesome. Yeah. And if you're not there, then be sure to watch the the recording of it for sure, because that sounds yeah, like some really interesting stuff. So you also published a, a book in uh, last year. Uh, microdosing magic, uh, a psychedelic yes. spell book. Um, so I, I don't really know anything about that. I mean, I, I've 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 microdosed myself uh, here and there, uh, and I'm wondering uh, if you'd if you'd want to talk a little bit about the uh, microdosing magic book. Absolutely. So microdosing magic is my kind of let's see how can I put this. Um, There are a lot of microdosing books out there, and they all pretty much say the same thing. Like if you go to like uh, Amazon.com and just click on them and check the table of contents, it's like chapter number one, what is microdosing? Chapter number two, a history of microdosing. Chapter number three, how to microdose. Chapter number four, different ways. It's the same thing. So what I wanted to provide was a spell book. And when I say spell book, uh, if magic and witchcraft isn't your thing, think of it more as mind hacking. It's a book of how to use uh, psychedelics along with mind hacking. And although the title is microdosing magic, you can use any dose size to kind of uh, try out the spells found therein. It's a practical manual. Mm. So there's just different spells in there, uh, you know, how to use uh, these things magically. So you can un-asshole yourself. Ah, uh, yes. There, there are ways <laughs> of using uh, psychedelics to unasshole yourself. Yes. Yeah. Do you do you think that that's? Uh, I mean, I I definitely feel that when I use uh, psychedelics and and I I tend to do it in you know maybe once every four months and I and I really in, intentionally and uh, I definitely feel a sense of unassholing and uh, maybe that's uh, a good thing. So I'm not uh, you know building up this ego that's leading to this. Uh, misogyny that wants to take over the world or whatever. Uh, it, I mean, obviously you find value in that. Oh, okay. So, yeah, so that, that, that you brought up a good point. So part of uh, the chapter on uh, micro, more, microdosing spells to unasshole yourself is, is deals with what I call ego tempering. So ego tempering is different from ego death. Ego death is what we experience, you know, a high dose of 5-MeO-DMT, uh, LSD, ayahuasca, all the good ones, right? Uh, mushrooms. But I find that sometimes people make the mistake of believing that because they temporarily suspended their ego while in that state, that once they're back in this plane of existence, they are now egoless. Uh, I'm sure some of your listeners have had somebody say to them at some point in time, well, you need to listen to me about how I killed my ego so I can teach you how to kill your ego. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Trust me, my ego is so much more killed than yours. Yeah, Yeah. exactly. Exactly. Take my word for it. I am egoless. So, um, so that's that's silly. We we need our ego. There's nothing wrong with having an ego. We're all born natural egoists. Ego, you know, gets you through life. Like all your best ideas are the result of your ego. All your magical ideas <laughs> that's all the result of your ego. The the best song you ever wrote, the best painting you ever painted, all your ego at work doing what it does. Now that's not to say that an e- that an overinflated ego can't get you into trouble, can't ruin relationships, you know, things like that. Of course it can. So I recommend not ego death, but ego tempering. So the next time, Mike, you said you microdose, um, try this. On one of the days you microdose, don't use the word I referring to yourself at all. No, I want this. I want that. I believe just don't use that Mm. word. Um, Two things you're going to, you might notice on that day, or if you do it over time or this one is how creatively you're going to start saying, making sentences <laughs> to avoid saying I, and two, how when your friends are asking you for advice, and we all do this, it's usually just an excuse to talk about ourselves and our experiences. Right. So try to take I out of it and, and see what happens. And uh, it's, uh, it's interesting. I've never gotten through a full day. I've always forgotten at some point and be like, ah, oh, shit, I brought, you know, well, it's hard. It's really I, hard. I will say, I will, and I mean I in the sense of E Y E. Well, that's or great. Try this. Or, or, or that sounds like an idea. That sounds like a good idea. 
Yeah, yeah. I'm going to have to order that book. That sounds fantastic. I, I can't wait to dive into that because there's so many ways that you can go. And like you said, you can look at these books and they can say, okay, yeah, take a microdose. And, you know, one of the things that, that I'm sort of a, a little critical of is, you know, and I think, look, I think all the things that are happening with psychedelics are great, whatever, but I th- I'm a little critical of this, like, businessman's trip, you know, take a, take a microdose and get into the office and be a better worker for this company. And I don't know. I mean, I, there's something to it that I feel is a little maybe missing the point. And uh, that's just my opinion, sure. but yeah. Sure. Of course. I, I, I'm somewhere with it. Like I actually have a chapter uh, in microdosing magic that argues against that um, in the sense that I think that for people who are, driven to do more than that it's a way to get out of that it's a way to stop working for someone else and actually start working for yourself and so i i give you know again just you know tips and tricks in the chapter to use along with psychedelics to kind of manifest what you're really going for um and i don't personally see anything wrong with that i want i want to see people happy and content with their lives and enjoying a rich life filled with love and enchantment and uh magic and substance and if that's where they're at and that's where they're trying to get you know like either away from or understand more or even recreate which would be the best thing you know change that model so that people that are in that model have this new paradigm for it i think all that would be great because we are we are sitting in it it is a part of uh, the reality that we do have to deal with and that there are people trying to alter that through altering themselves i mean that's magic that's beautiful i think that's great yeah, that's right. That's true. I mean, we do live in the, in a, in a world of magic, and you know, a lot of of history has been to kind of suppress that and and keep people kind of, you know, like you said, in in, in enchantment. Like that needs to be re reintroduced. And I think you're doing that with your work. Like, let's get back in touch with this mystery, with this wonder, with this you know amazing enchantment with the natural world and our connection to it and the cosmos. And you know, I'm I'm wondering, like, as we're kind of nearing the end here, I, I I'd like to kind of get like a big take, you know, from you, because we, we do sort of find ourselves in a couple of weeks, I'm going to be, uh, talking about, um, some of, uh, Daniel Pinchbeck's work with, uh, his book, how soon is now, uh, you know, some just, I I've taken some parts of that and among parts of what other people have written about, uh, Christopher Ryan is another author who talks about civilization and how, you know, we're moving in, in towards this thing. And I think Daniel talks more about the climate, uh, crisis, but we are, we are in this interesting time, I think right now. Right. And uh, of course, every generation thinks that their time is the time, mm-hmm. but we're definitely at this time where there's stuff happening. Things are going on. Things are happening with the planet, with society, with infrastructure, with, all this stuff. Uh, I'm wondering, like, you know, with with the work that you're doing, because you're digging in and you're exploring this stuff, and it has to be for a particular kind of reason. Uh, and I think that, um, you know, as we are living in this time now, how we can sort of apply these things to the situation in which we find ourselves. And I think you were just recently at uh, the Guy in Mind conference. Is that right? Uh, yeah, I, I helped organize it. Oh, excellent. Excellent. So yeah, there you go. Perfect. So then we can, t- since you helped organize it, clearly this is, uh, is, is something of, of importance to you. And, and maybe you can kind of uh, shed some light on, I guess, where we find ourselves now and, and how we can kind of maybe learn from these uh, mystery traditions and all this stuff to apply it to where we find ourselves in. Sure. So the simple- kind of a, kind of a small, just a small question, a small not a big question. deal. Yeah, and, and we're <laughs> Un- unravel the mystery of humanity. Okay, um, let's see. Uh, in, uh, let's see. Um, for me, wonder and enchantment are the things that originally make us the most human. That sp- that part of us that is the soul of humanity, and that is this timeless thing that I think everyone, or you know, most people that have a spiritual side, I should say, there are certainly people that are non-believers, uh, and all respect to them. But for those of us that are believers, I think that we're all trying to get back to that that moment, that 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 you know, that spark of human wonderment and enchantment that lit up the ape. What what uh what McKenna would call you know the stoned ape theory. You know whether there were mushrooms involved or not is not for anyone to say. But there was that that time when we ceased being 
you know, what we were and became human. And I think that, you know, and along with that, and I, I make arguments for this in, in psychedelic mystery traditions, along with that came this idea of these other worlds and this sense of something beyond the veil. And which is interesting because we know scientifically now that we only see like 1% of what's actually, you know, really going on or, or, or a small percentage of what's actually happening around us. So, um, you know, which I, I believe you get to access through things like DMT and, uh, you know, ayahuasca mm-hmm. and things like that and um, uh, mushrooms, of course. But so we're, we, we all seem to be trying to get back to that. And what I wanted to show was that the West does have these traditions as well uh, with my with my works, uh, with my books, because um, when you look at, um, you know, popular ideas about this stuff, it's all based on like the, you know, Aztec or Incan or Mayan use of peyote or mushrooms or the Siberian shaman use of Amanita muscaria or the Peruvian use of ayahuasca. But people don't really ever talk about the Western psychedelic experience and the history of it. So I just wanted to, you know, put, put a flag out there and just say that, you know, th- this does exist. And I'm not the only one. Uh, Chris Bennett has done a fantastic job of also uh, bringing this stuff uh, to light. So uh, Danny Nemo, I believe as well. Uh, um, oh yeah. I had him on the show. Yeah. Yeah. He works a lot in the old Testament. Uh, and, yeah. uh, he's, uh, I, he's in the, uh, his article got accepted as well. I think, um, I, yeah, I'm pretty sure it did for the, uh, the same journal. So we're going to, we're both going to be published in the forthcoming, uh, journal of psychedelic studies, along with, uh, uh, my friend and colleague and frequent debate, uh, partner, Jerry Brown is also, uh, uh, has an article as well. Oh, good, good, a good, good friend and a good healthy debate. That's always that's what we need. You know, oh, we yeah. need to definitely open yeah. open this up for a good healthy discourse. Oh, absolutely, Jerry. I I love Jerry. I love Julie. I think the world of them. I mean, we you know before our debate. I mean, this is going to be our third public debate. I mean, we go out, we get dinner, like you know, like you know, after or before the debate. Uh, when I was in Santa Barbara, I stayed at his house because I was giving a talk um, for uh, Laps, the uh, 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 Brad Adams Group, the Los Angeles uh, uh, was a medicinal plant society, Lamps. And, um, yeah, he was up in Portland. He stays at my place. You know, like I, I love Jerry. He's great. He's a, he's a wonderful, wonderful human. And, and so is Julie. Nice. Yeah. And, uh, I, w- I was wondering actually, just since you brought up the psychedelic uh, traditions in, in the, in a Western context, are there any particular, are there any stories that, that stand out to you or uh, ones that you particularly like that, that maybe you could share a, a quick little story of something that, uh, that's, that's, that's important that you think is important to kind of communicate to the, the Western psychedelic tradition? Sure. Um, yeah, I think this is important. In 1428, Matteuccia de Francesco La Strega de Casarepe Bianca was executed for witchcraft. Now, Matteuccia, which means in Italian, darling little female Matthew. So apparently her parents thought they were maybe going to have a son, and they wanted to name that son Matthew, but out came a girl, so they named her Matteuccia. And um, Matucha is some of our best evidence for the use of um, psychedelic or entheogenic, uh, or I would argue somnotheogenic um, ointments, or what I call transvection ointments, uh, which is the Latin word for soul travel. We would say astral proje- projection. In the Latin, they would say transvection. And um, so in, in Matucha's record, it's very interesting because you get part of her record, her, her record exists in two sp- spheres. The first part of her record is all folk magic, untainted with any diabolical dressing whatsoever, just the regular stuff that this wise woman did. It's so fascinating and informative to see what this, you know, this real wise woman was actually doing. And now... The thing is, towards the end of her record, there's a shift when she was tortured. They, they brought in, uh, an inquisitor and then they tortured her. Now, the, the second part of her record all deals with diabolism and witchcraft and, and or, or, or diabolical witchcraft and Satanism, things like that, and murdering babies, right? So to make her magical potions. But here's the thing. The hinge that changes her record from folk practice to theological stereotype is her magical flying ointment. So then we put 
put a microscope on that and we see that we can actually tease out of the right. I did. I do it in uh, psychedelic mystery traditions and to some extent in the witch's ointment and uh, very much so in the article that just came out. But you could actually that that's coming out, I should say. Sorry. But you could actually tease out the um, the folk beliefs about her ointment from what the inquisitors were saying about her ointment. So she would rub this on her on her arms and her body and sing her magic words. We actually have preserved in the records the magic words Matucha recited while applying her psychedelic ointment. And they were, and I quote, ointment, ointment, bring me to the night doings at Benevento, over water, over wind, over all bad weather. Hmm. Now, right after that, it says in the record that she continued to chant to it, uh, uh, invoke demons. See, there's the theological stereotype. That chant is not found in any uh, literary tradition where a lot of the satanic witchcraft ideas were pulled from. That's authentic folk psychedelia. Now, when she says, take me to the walnut tree in Benevento, Benevento is this place in Italy where witches, or wise women, I would say, but witches, theologians would say, would gather around a walnut tree to celebrate their spirituality, whatever that was, we don't know, because the authors of her trial dossier said that she went there to worship the devil. Now, we know she didn't really have this out-of-body experience, this astral projection, this transvection experience to worship the devil, you know, but we don't know what she actually went there to do. I hypothesize she went there to worship one of many fertility goddesses found all over uh, the Western world, and that the the uh, the inquisitors just pulled the, this uh, this female divinity's name out of the record and inserted the name of the devil. Wow, jeez! I think that is a very important record for what it says about because she was burned for that. And that oh my god. Was, uh, what that says about cognitive liberty yes um and the need to release anybody i'm glad i'm seeing this all over the, the united states but it has to happen worldwide i don't know how to do that but at least it's starting here people being released from prison for minor cannabis convictions that is absurd when this idiot kamala harris is out there trying to make money off cannabis and she's literally throwing people in prison for it right yeah yeah, it's we need to we, cognitive liberty needs to be upheld and, and these spiritual people need liberty. to be expunged spiritual liberty. Everybody has has the freedom and the right to practice what they choose and communicate with, with with who they choose. And, you know, this this is this is a very, very important thing. I mean, this is our birthright to some extent, you know, is to is em, 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 embrace this this wonder and this mystery and make of it what we wish. And, you know, that oh, yeah. that I think like, so. I, I, I oh, I'm oh, sorry, you're going to say. No, no, go for it. Oh, I, I interrupt you. No, no, it's fine. I, I, I just wanted to, I, I, I think I'm in Denver and you're in Portland. And I think, you know, we happen to be privileged to li be living in, in a place yeah. where this kind of thing is, is, is kind of taking off a little bit, you know, like I, I meet people who are, who are getting involved and in doing their own things, whether it be, you know, gong baths or, uh, you know, different kinds of ceremonies and practices and really, and there's a lot of female leaders emerging too. Okay. And I'm really excited about this because I really think that if we're going to save the planet, save the world, save humanity, whatever, if you want to get grandiose about it, but really bringing back this empowered female spirit that's connecting with the divine. I mean, I think we kind of need that. You know, I was reading about these, the Iroquois tribes and how they had a council of elder women that they would go to and, and negotiate. And like before you were talking about the Oracle and going to see the Oracle and yeah. seeing her, this divine feminine energy connected with the goddess spirit of, of, of what, of what is informing them of their practices. So, uh, yeah, I think I'm a little, I'm a little hopeful. And, and do you see things kind of moving in, in this direction too? more, more women I, coming and emerging? I, I absolutely do. And I encourage them to, um, you know, stand out and be heard as well. And I encourage, uh, guys to support them. And make sure this voice is heard. And yeah, it does uh, kick back to ancient days. Look, in ancient Greece, a priestess was one of the most powerful women in society. Right. <laughs> in Oracle, I mean, like, you know, we talk about, so how could I put this? Okay, so in, in ancient Greece, an Oracle could have a king killed. 
a king could not touch that oracle. <laughs> like, are you kidding? Like, you weren't allowed to do anything to the oracle. Right. I mean, people did, but it was it was not, you know, it, it was very much illegal. Um, yeah. But uh, no, they held a very high status. And I think that, um, and we are seeing that. I mean, I'm, I'm going to, uh, actually, uh, my partner and I are going to take, uh, uh, have a, a sit with ayahuasca when we get back from breaking convention. And our facilitator is a, is a female. Yeah. Yeah. No. And I, I spent a lot of time down in the Amazon at, uh, an ayahuasca center led by, uh, female Shipibo healers. And, you know, it, it, it's definitely, I've, I definitely grew up in this kind of macho, toxic masculinity container in, in New York where I, where I'm from. And that there's a, Oh, you're from New York. Yeah. No, oh, cool. What part? Uh, Franklin square. Oh. On Long Island, and then I moved to Long Beach. Oh, Long Island. Everyone always thinks I'm from Long Island. I have a Long Island face or something. So, <laughs> but I'm from uh, Nyack, Rockland County. Yeah. Uh, just uh, outside of Westchester. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, Rockland. Rockland. There's a community college out there, right? That's like right. Rockland Community College. Yep, yep. Oh, yep. I almost got a job teaching there, but I wanted to get the hell out of New York. Yeah, so. me too. Yeah, I left I left New York. But I, there was such a, a great you know, gr- wise grandmother presence with these female Shipibo, uh, ayahuasqueros, these maestras. And uh, it, it's changed my life. And like, I've, I'm just kind of in this mode of thinking that like, that is what we need. We need these, these, these wise women to, to, to come of, to come up and, and to be put up and to be held up. Uh, because we can't, yeah. we can't just do it in this singular narrative that we've been running with for, you know, this predominant, uh, narrative. Wow. Yeah. Oh, of course. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree totally with that. Absolutely. Um, and uh, I mean, for me also, it, it helps because some of the stronger medicines like ayahuasca is very much female energy. So, um, you know, handling it uh, with that, you know, just that 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 timeless mystique and delicate beauty mm. that, that women just possess, like is just, uh, you know, I'm I'm looking forward to this ayahuasca, you know, like and seeing my facilitator and making that connection again, as much as I'm looking forward to going to breaking convention you know, yeah. at this point, you know, and I, I love, you know, uh, sitting with, uh, you know, I'm one of those people that just says sitting with mom, because for me, uh, you know, I is Gaia and, uh, is the, uh, you know, the cosmic rail, the source of the universe. And, uh, I, um, yeah, I can't wait to uh, to see her again. Yeah, can, can you, that that was so beautiful. The the cosmic mystique that that you just mentioned. That's that's a, such a great way to put oh, it. Oh yeah, that time. You know what I'm talking yeah, about. Totally, that, yeah, totally. Yeah, that, that gentle and timeless. You could do like when they they have that that look in their eye that that's just pure magic, and it's just like yeah, and it's just that divine feminine kind of spark. Yeah, and it's just it's fantastic, and that's. I mean, that's really our oldest spirituality. I mean, when you look at the the the, the oldest relics, again, I go over this in psychedelic mystery traditions, especially relics that tie um, uh, divinities to psychoactives, they're all female. I mean, there, there are these terracotta goddess statues with the opium poppy uh, that are all over the Mediterranean. I mean, you know, and then you get stories of Isis, um, who, who was, uh, you know, written as the great sorceress in the Ebers Papyrus. And uh, a, um, the, the, the author of this text says that Isis inspired her to write a... Um, uh, uh, an opium potion and this opium potion would bring people into the realm of Isis where she could heal them. I mean, it's, you know, we, we definitely need to promote that divine feminine. Absolutely. Totally. And, and all the writing is there. It's on the walls. It's in the books. Oh, you're, yeah. you're bringing oh, yeah. it forward. You're synthesizing this. Oh, and yeah. It's all there. Yeah. And, and, and so I'm, you know, so grateful that you're, you're birthing these creations into the world and talking about these things uh, in this time, in this new psychedelic renaissance that we find ourselves in where really it's uh, the doors are open and we're creating as we go. And if we can, if we can have the, uh, you know, the wisdom to look back to the past and to take what works and to learn from that and apply it to now, I see an optimistic future ahead of us. As do I, my friend. Excellent. Well, Tom has this. 
Thank you so much. Go and check out uh, his website, psychedelicwitch.com. I know that uh, we, we connected over uh, Instagram and you're on Instagram as well, where you post there under Witchy Delic. And man, I can't, I'm going to get my hands on uh, these these books, Microdosing Magic, a psychedelic spell book. I'm really excited actually to dive into that. Check out Psychedelic Mystery Tradition, Spirit Plant Magical Practices, and S Ecstatic States, and The Witch's Ointment, The Secret History of Psychedelic Magic. And then look out for that breaking convention debate. That'll be exciting. Anything else, uh, Thomas, that you'd like to share? Yeah. I also, the bulk of my videos are on facebook.com slash the psychedelic witch. Excellent. Facebook.com slash the psychedelic witch. Go check out those videos, folks. Thank you so much for spending time with me today and the psychedelic crew. Uh, we really appreciate you and, uh, yeah, looking forward to, to what comes next. Thanks. Hey, I hope you guys enjoyed that conversation as much as I did. Hope you guys like these podcasts and enjoy them. And if you do, please spread the podcast, share it, tell a neighbor, tell a coworker, tell a friend, tell a cat, tell a mouse, tell a dog, tell an ant, tell a firefly, tell whoever you tell, share it, spread it, like it, all that good stuff. If you if you really love the show, you want to go a step further, you really want to help us out, leave a five-star rating and review on Apple Podcasts um, and go to patreon.com. Patreon slash Mike Brank and um, patreon.com slash Mike Brank. And you can donate as little as a dollar a month, two dollars a month, whatever you want. Help support the show that way as well. But remember, I love you guys no matter what you do. I just love that you tune in and you enjoy these podcasts. Message me. I like hearing feedback. Get in touch with me on Instagram, Mike Adelic Podcast, Mike Brank on Facebook as well. And um, thanks to our sponsors, Synchro and Hemp Bombs, if you want. A discount on keto, genic, and plant-based nutrition products. Go to Synchro and type in the code uh, Mikeadelic at checkout to get 20% off. And they have amazing ketogenic chocolate fudge called Keto Mana that I have all the time because it's, it has like no sugar and carbs in it. So it's great. And, um, and it's delicious. And if you want CBD, uh, go to hempbombs.com and get 15% off all your CBD needs, I guess. And... Uh, just enter the code Mike15 at checkout. But thank you once again to everybody. Thanks to Danny Barnett and Galaxia for the music, the intro, and the outro. I love you all. Peace.